Good morning, Marta. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak to you today and um, to rethink with you all what it means to do intercultural communication. My focus in rethinking intercultural communication is on the role of English, it, the role of English in our field and um, not only the dominance of English as the global lingua franca, we all know that, that's no news. What I want to focus on is what the dominance of English and the way that we communicate in English, that we publish in English, that we think in English, what that means for our understanding of intercultural communication and also for the way we do intercultural communication. We often think about um, intercultural com or the role of English in intercultural communication as just neutral, you know, it's just a language. and. Um, that's what it is as a lingua franca, but I want to specifically ask um, where linguistically are the centers of our field? Who produces research in our field? Do all of us, as we come to English from various linguistic backgrounds, from various places of origin, do we all have an equal chance to contribute to knowledge creation in our field or maybe not? So intercultural communication is a notoriously interdisciplinary field. And so let's look at um, where most of the research for some of our contributing disciplines is produced. Let's start out with applied psychology. The five most dominant countries where research is produced, and these are the data I'm showing you here are from Sky Margo, so from the academic journals, rankings list. And so basically, these are the most central and the most impactful and the most respected pieces of research in applied psychology. As you can see, um, an overwhelming number of um, research papers in applied, uh, applied psychology come out of the United States, followed by the UK, Germany, Canada, Australia. So that's for applied psychology, major contributor to our field. Now let's move on to communication studies, also really big for intercultural communication. As you can see here, um, again, the, um, the top five countries are um, different from the top five countries for applied psychology, but the two top countries are the same. Um, again, huge dominance by the United States, followed by the UK, and then we have the Sp Spain, China, and Australia. Um, another area that contributes to our field is cultural studies. And um, very similar picture emerges. We again see the dominance of the United States, UK in second place, and um, some other countries, uh, followed by actually also included two very small um, but Anglophone nations, Australia and Canada. And finally, um, the another major contributing discipline to research in our field, the one where I'm actually located, languages and linguistics, very similar figures, um, slightly different countries, but again, the leaders are researchers in the United States and the UK. So um, what these figures are supposed to show you is give you an impression of the overwhelming dominance of publications by researchers based in these two countries. Now, um, these are the top five countries and actually um, the research in most of these fields coming out of the United States alone is more than all the other research combined. So um, these are huge numbers and um, to keep that impact in perspective, it's actually good to remind ourselves that um, the United States and the UK together account for only five, a bit over 5% of the global population. Even so, that is where the research is produced. Now let's look at um, who the 
thought leaders in our field are. And the thought leaders are a bit different from um, where research is produced, but not much. It's just a different way really to gauge the impact of um, Anglophone research really. And that's what I'm interested in here. So um, what this um, pie chart shows you is actually, it's based on account from Google Scholar for um, the fields of applied linguistics and sociolinguistics, so again, two major contributing disciplines to intercultural communication, where a lot of the research for our field happens. And what school, Google Scholar does, it um, counts the um, citation metrics for people who have a Google Scholar profile. And so you can actually just count who are the most influential um, applied linguists, or sociolinguists, or whatever. And um, so that's what I've done here. I've um, identified the 100 most influential applied linguists and the 100 most influential sociolinguists. And influence here is counted by the number of citations these people have. And um, as you can see, 55% of the most influential sociolinguists and applied linguists come again from the US and the UK. Maybe not surprising given how much they publish and how they actually dominate the field in terms of knowledge production. So it's, it's a circle really where a lot of production leads to a lot of influence together with other Anglophone countries. And so the other Anglophone countries are basically um, Ireland, Australia, Canada, South Africa, um, New Zealand. These also have a disproportionate impact. If we um, combine the 55% of the UK, US and UK influential researchers and the 15% from other Anglophone countries, Researchers from Anglophone countries account for the 70% most influential people in our fields. And um, then we have another fairly large chunk for um, researchers from continental Europe. And only 12% are researchers from what I call for want of a better word and in quotation marks here, the rest of the world. So this is hugely disproportionate to um, the actual population numbers of these countries. And just, um, I said already earlier, to put this in perspective, um, only 5% of the world's population live in the US and the UK. So this is an overrepresentation by a factor of 10. And um, in China, for instance, where 18% of the world's population live, there is not a single scholar who is actually listed amongst the top 100 most influential scholars in these fields. So that's hugely disproportionate and clearly a linguistic factor because um, China also you know, invests hugely in research and produces a lot of research. What I've just told you in terms of who produces research and whose research is impactful, who are the thought leaders in our field, may strike you as a bit academic. And you can say, well, you know, I mean, this is what academics all about is all about. It's all about competition and everyone wants to be really well cited and wants to publish a lot. So um, maybe that's not so important in the way we think about intercultural communication. And maybe it doesn't matter where the researchers are based. Well, that's actually not the case. Where researchers are based matters hugely in terms of the kinds of questions that are asked, the kinds of problems that are produced, and the way we actually think about intercultural communication. And um, a person who made this very strikingly is um, the anthropologist Joseph Henrich, who um, a couple of years ago wrote a book, which I'd warmly recommend to you, um, The Weirdest People in the World. And the weirdest people for him are um, precisely those Anglophone people that I've just been talking about. The, the reason he calls them weird is that he uses weird as an acronym and um, weird stands for Western, educated, 
industrialized, rich, and democratic. And he says, um, this is actually a fairly unusual psychological profile historically and internationally, but that's where we do most of our research. So he examined research papers in psychology and um, all the kinds of experimental psychology that is done and that we often treat as, you know, just human research. This is about humans. But um, what he found was that that experimental research that is sold to us as being about humans, about people, irrespective of their background, is actually very specific. In his research, he discovered, or in this meta research, he discovered that 96% of research participants in experimental psychology were drawn from Europe, North America, and Australia. So what we think about as humans, or what we think about as people, is actually a very specific subset. So when we see that research is dominated by researchers from this, these places, it also means that they dominate what we see as culture. And um, so 96% of research participants from these places and 70% of these were actually American undergraduates. So that's a very specific demographic. And um, we really don't take enough account of that. And if you want to read up on that a bit more, there is another book I want to recommend to you. And that's um, Ethan Watter's Crazy Like Us. I've shown you the German title here because um, the, the English subtitle is The Globalization of the American Psyche, but um, the German subtitle is How America Makes the Rest of the World Crazy. And um, this is really an interesting book in that it examines how the ideas of mental health that were first produced and, and, and uh, emerged in the culture, of, in the weird culture of North America are now spreading around the world and really leading to an epidemic in mental health. As I've just said, weird researchers from Anglophone countries, particularly the US and the UK, do weird research with weird populations that are actually very unusual globally. And um, I now want to exemplify this with um, a piece of my own research and um, one that is really relevant to rethinking intercultural communication as we come out of the global pandemic, I mean, hopefully we're coming out of the pandemic. Let's look at public health communication and um, how public health issues were communicated globally in the early stages of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. The research I'm drawing on here has been collated and edited by myself and um, my team on language on the move so if you want to go there we've got the COVID-19 archive some openly accessible you can see the URL here and um, we've collected a lot of research from all around the world around the ways in which public health information in the early stages of the pandemic was communicated to diverse populations and one thing we discovered was that um, minority populations, linguistic minority populations, but other marginalized populations as well, were excluded from information right from the get go. And um, that our early diagnosis of communicative exclusion was correct has actually been borne out by um, uh, fatality figures that emerged in 2021, so in a later stage of the crisis, where it was actually shown um, in a number of countries that linguistic minorities, migrant populations and indigenous populations were disproportionately affected by the global, by the pandemic and um, suffered worse health outcomes and had higher fatality rates than the majority populations in their countries. So what went wrong in terms of public health communication? Well, public health communication from the get-go was 
weird. It was very um, technocratic. It was informed by a Western model of mass communication. And there were three problems that we identified in our research. The first problem was that a lot of public health communication in the early stages was literacy centric. That is, it was written communication and targeting often populations that were not particularly literate. So we've got case studies from um, rural Indonesia, from rural Pakistan, from Peru, from various African nations um, showing and, and, you know, also actually from um, industrialized nations where there are significant minorities who have low levels of literacies showing that um, the literacy dominance actually excluded people who had low levels of literacy. And so there was no, no consideration of the mismatch between the communicative needs of low literacy populations and the information that was mostly provided through the written medium. So information like, you know, wash your hands, wear masks, and um, how, how to prevent the spread of infection and so on and so forth. Another finding that we had across the board was that a lot of the um, communication was English centric. I've got the image that I'm showing you here is from a school in Pakistan. And um, as you can see, the information that was provided is basically monolingual in English, although only a minority of the population is actually proficient in English and not even the national language Urdu, let alone any of the minority languages featured in a lot of the communication. Now, not um, the, the English centrism is specific to certain nations, um, either nations that see themselves as English dominant and where we saw an exclusion of linguistic minorities. Um, we've got a lot of research also from Australia, which of course is, you know, an Anglophone nation, but at the same time, there are um, around a million Australians, so that accounts for around 3% of the population who actually have very low levels of proficiency in English. And there was no effort made or very late in the pandemic efforts started to actually target that population in languages other than English. In um, other in, in other nations, there was a centrism of the standard. So it wasn't always English. So for instance, in the Indonesian research that I mentioned earlier and that you can read up in our COVID archives, the, um, the dominant language was Bahasa. And um, again, lots and lots of um, the minority languages or the minoritized languages on the archipelago, which is, you know, Indonesia is a very multilingual nation. They are, those were excluded. And even the Indonesia, the Bahasa that was used was actually of a very high register and included a lot of loan words from English. So um, one thing that happened with the pandemic was actually that you know, we all learned a lot of new words. I mean, COVID-19, in fact, was um, a word that didn't exist until February 2020, when the World Health Organization named the disease COVID. And then this word spread across the world and spread from one language to the other. And um, many similar terms like lockdown, home office, they really became quite dominant in all kinds of languages. So even if another standard language was used, there was a heavy infiltration of loan words from English. So um, what I mean by English centric or standard centric is there wasn't enough attention paid to the needs of linguistic minorities who um, had no proficiency in English or in a standard national language or low levels of proficiency. And finally, another problem that we discovered was actually um, what we call digital centric, that um, a lot of the communication was 
disseminated through digital media, through social media, online, um, even for populations who have very, very little access. So for instance, in um, the Pakistan case study, what we discovered was that one of the main channels for the, ministry, the, the health ministry was actually Facebook, except that um, there were very, very few people who have Facebook and the follower numbers of that Facebook channel of the health department were actually exceedingly low. So, um, and, and in, in, in rural areas, both in Indonesia and in, um, and in Pakistan, simply the coverage was just so low that again, this was a real mismatch. So um, Western ideas of what public health communication looks like were often applied indiscriminately and led to a failure of public health communication with dire and disastrous consequences for minoritized populations with low levels of literacy, with low levels of proficiency in the standard language and or in English, and with limited access to um, digital communication channels. While many nations and many states and, and many non-governmental actors really got um, public health information terribly wrong in the early stages of the pandemic, as I've just explained to you, there were also positive examples, except those positive examples really did not make it onto the international scene. One positive example that we've examined is um, China where the idea of language services has really been quite important in applied linguistics and in sociolinguistics since the early 21st century and is becoming really a, a key paradigm to understand how we can improve communication, how we can improve mass communication and ensure that not only the dominant population, the weird population, the people who are educated, the people who are literate, the people who are proficient in the dominant language, um, the people who have access to digital media are being reached, but everyone, that we have inclusive communication. So that's been a key focus of Chinese sociolinguistics or Chinese applied linguists since um, the early 21st century. And um, these people and, and our colleagues in China sprang into action very early in the pandemic with emergency language services. Again, we've documented those on the COVID-19 archives on language on the move. Um, examples such as um, providing materials in the Hubei dialect or in the various Hubei dialects for emergency personnel from all across China who came to Wuhan in the early stages of the pandemic to help out there. Um, volunteer translation efforts to help with logistics and sourcing with uh, personal protective equipments in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, volunteer translators and interpreters to help international students based in China and so on and so forth to really make a concerted effort. And um, what we've done in addition to um, publishing that case study, really, the, the, the Wuhan case study on language on the move is we've also, together with my colleagues um, Jenny Shang and Li Jia, Jenny is based at Shonan University of um, Economics and Law in Wuhan, and um, Li Jia is based at um, Yunnan University in Kunming. So the three of us together edited a special issue of Multilingua devoted to linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. And um, this was really a Chinese centric issue. What we tried to do is bring actually this concept of um, emergency language services and the way it was applied to actually support 
public health communication in the early stages of the pandemic with diverse populations within China, but also with Chinese populations around the world. So we put that together in this special issue where we collaborated with a, a larger number of scholars and really tried to decenter applied linguistics from the West which had clearly failed, as I showed you earlier, and look at more positive examples. And um, we, the special issue, which is also available open access, uh, I've just shown you the URL. Um, you can just Google Multilingua and then navigate to um, the 2020 issues, and there you'll find the special issue. So um, one thing that we conceptualize or we show in the special issue is actually um, Professor Li Yu Ming's concept of a national emergency language competence that nations, states, institutions, organizations need to think systematically about um, communication and language needs during emergency and the way um, these colleagues are conceptualizing national emergency language competence. You can see that here on the slide, but um, basically they are looking at um, the stage of an emergency, so um, preparatory stage, so that language and communication needs really need to be included in disaster and emergency preparation. And that has happened in China in the most recent five-year plan. So um, language communication is really there and that's you know, immensely admirable. Then um, to look at the language and communication needs during an um, emergency and also in the recovery phase after. And this is also conceptualized around type. So what kind of linguistic and communication needs are there? Um, need, communication needs in the standard national language, in non-standard varieties, in minority languages, in the major international languages in cross-border languages and in sign languages and braille. And then um, questions around capacity building and the various tasks that are involved. I won't really go into too much of the details here. You can look it up. The key point I'm making is that um, our weird research, our focus on the Anglosphere, the, the, the um, disproportionate influence that Anglophone scholars wield mean that we often overlook important research, important concepts, important improvement in practices that come out of other places that come that emerge outside the Anglosphere. And so we ignore them, we don't value them. And um, what um, Jenny Shang and Li Jia and I try to do in this special issue is actually center a Chinese concept and bring that to the attention of um, you know, global academia and global intercultural communication research. So really this one way street of knowledge traffic that comes from the Anglosphere just disrupted a little bit and challenged it a little bit by focusing a concept from the global south, a Chinese centric concept. I consider the um, Language on the Move COVID-19 archives and the special issue of Multilingua devoted to linguistic diversity in a time of crisis as a major challenge to um, the hegemony of Anglocentrism, um, both linguistically and epistemologically that I outlined to you earlier in this presentation. So what remains to be done in the um, remaining few minutes of my presentation is actually to ask, well, how did we do it? How did we go about mounting this challenge to Anglocentrism and why did we do it? Um, well, we actually reflect on that in a collaborative autoethnography and um, we reach three conclusions that I want to um, share with you as takeaway messages, I hope, from um, this presentation. So how did we go about it? Well, um, for us, the pandemic was actually personal right from the start. Um, the photo that you see here is um, 
from 2012 during an intercultural communication conference in Wuhan. And um, so the, the, the pandemic was personal from the start because myself and um, my team, we all had strong, uh, strong links to Wuhan. So um, Jenny is based there and um, many of us have visited there and um, we've had long personal relationships. And so um, early in the pandemic, I just reached out to um, Jenny, who had been my PhD student and has been a, a trusted friend and collaborator for many years to see you know, how they were going. And um, we started out on Language on the Move, actually with the idea for people, um, colleagues from China, to be able to blog about their experience. And that was at a time when um, COVID-19 was still an epidemic in China and hadn't actually mutated into the pandemic yet. So um, we were drawing on our academic and personal networks and um, we were inspired by our moral commitment that we wanted to, you know, to create an alternative vision of um, global academic knowledge. What often goes for global, and I've put that in quotation marks here on the slide, what often goes for global academic knowledge is, as I've shown to you, Anglo-centric. It's actually weird. It's actually the, the, the knowledge of a minority of the global population. Um, so our commitment is to actually center all voices and to you know, provide a bit of a vision that is truly global and also brings other knowledges to the fore and provides them with a platform in the most central circuits of academic knowledge production. Um, we did that through um, a lot of textual scaffolding. So the, um, the COVID-19 archives on language on the move and the special issue were an incredibly labor intensive process. Um, we provided so much support to editorial support in particular to all our authors from um, all of them from outside the Anglosphere and um, all of them multilingual authors and thinkers. And, and by multilingual, I, I mean here that they speak English as an additional language, as I do. And we did that because we believe that knowledge creation actually is about community building and needs to rest on an ethics of care, that we actually do not just create knowledge in the abstract. What matters is actually that we work together in um, in networks and that we bring our personalities and our friendships and um, our relationships into our research and that we support each other. And that brings me to the third um, takeaway message that those of us who are centrally placed in these circuits and um, most you know, reasonably academic, uh, successful academics are placed in very central circuits we need to actually act as linguistic and epistemic brokers and, and confront our privilege. I mean, we all speak from different um, places. Um, for me personally, as someone who has been fairly successful in intercultural communication research, actually centering other voices and other knowledges has been um, a, a, a responsibility that comes from that privilege to actually be able to also speak to you today at this conference. Um, what remains before I close, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions now, is actually just for me to say that everything that I've spoken about here has already been published and written up. So um, Jenny Lee Jia and I have just published another article in Multilingua where we actually um, address these issues of epistemic injustice and, and talk about the way we created knowledge about public health communication in the early stages of the pandemic as a positive case study. And so this is also, um, this is available of, for open access on the Multilingua website. You can see the URL here. You can also just Google it. Um, 
this also provides a bit of um, view into the black box of academic publishing, which is often very, very mystified for um, people from out, outside the Anglosphere or also junior scholars, of course, within the Anglosphere. And um, so our collaborative autoethnography really is just also a bit of a look into the black box. How does one actually successfully publish in a Q1 journal and how do you go about, how did we go about it and why, how did we do it and why did we do it? And um, there is also, as happens with all our publications or all the publications of members from the Language on the Move team, there is also an easy reader version um, available also open access on language on the move how to challenge anglocentricity in academic publishing with that i want to thank you for your um, attention and i'm very much looking forward to your questions thank you very much